And uh, she, everything Robin said is mostly correct, particularly the part about me not listening before any of that. Um, but what I will also say is, no, I didn't actually come around to her point of view. It's just more that nobody really resists Robin when she has her mind set on something. So here I am. <laughs> um, so with that, I'm just going to go ahead and get started. Uh, as you can tell, I'm going to be talking about leadership, collaboration, risk, and uh, kayaking. So the first question you probably all have is, what exactly do these concepts have in common? What is the connection between kayaking, collaboration, and leadership? Hopefully I don't have to explain risk. I think risk applies to all of these. There's risk in all of these, inherent in all of these. Um, so what I decided to do was explain a few things about both kayaking and leadership and then see how it all comes together in a discussion of collaboration. Um, but before I get started, I want to sort of talk about what my kind of kayaking is. And my kind of kayaking is a little bit unique. I mean, it's not entirely unique, but there's all different kinds of kayaking. So one thing I just want to explain for those who aren't paddlers, there are all sorts of different flavors of kayaking. There's, you know, this kind of kayaking, which is the recreational kind that Robin was thinking about. You go out, it's sunny, there's palm trees. There's not much when it comes to, you know, waves or surf. It's really a lot of fun. Then there's what Brad does. He goes out and he's kayak fishing. He's got, you know, what is it, four fishing poles out there. He's got a custom designed fishing rod and he has a blast. And it's not, it's more than recreational. It's very intense, but it's a little bit different. And then you all saw the uh, kayak slaloming and kayak racing at the Olympics. And of course, we're familiar with whitewater kayaking and all that good stuff. So I figured I should probably start by explaining a little bit about what my kind of kayaking is. So I'll start by showing you what it's not. It's not that kind of kayaking. <laughs> Um, not that there's, I was going to say, not that there's anything against that, and in all honesty, this guy was about to, uh, I believe, circumnavigate Manhattan, along with a bunch of swimmers. No, he really was. Uh, he was kayak support for a series of swimmers, so let's, you know, just because we caught him in a moment of relaxation there. <laughs> and Vlad would only give me the photo if we couldn't see his face, so there you go. Um, but it's not that kind of kayaking. The kind of kayak I, I do is uh, a subset of sea kayaking. Um, let me explain a little bit about what sea kayaking is. First of all, you notice that boat is long and skinny compared to this boat. You also no notice that the paddler is actually sitting in it, not on it. You notice that the paddler is also wearing a spray skirt, so he's essentially attached to the boat, which is, has some kind of interesting impacts in the event of a capsize, because he's attached to the boat. Uh, and we'll talk about that, and I do have a, an anecdote about that. Um, you'll also notice that he's wearing a um, dry suit because he's probably out there in the winter. And in fact, I don't know about what that water is, but it's looking mighty cold. Um, and one of the key things about sea kayaking is, as Robin said, you do do it in all kinds of weather. You do it in wind, snow, hail, uh, ice. You do it when the water is down at about 32 degrees. And you can, you know, if it freezes solid, you can't paddle. But anything short of that, you're probably in pretty good shape. Um, I would also highlight the fact that sea kayaking is actually, when done correctly, a highly skilled sport. Uh, and for we, ha we do have a handful of British people here, including somebody who I want to say is BCU certified. Yes. Um, and I have to highlight something. When, Robin, when I was talking to Robin, I said, listen, I, you know, I really have, I have no grounds to talk about kayaking because I'm not a great kayaker. In fact, I'm not necessarily even a very good kayaker. And she said, oh, John, nobody's going to know. And, uh, of course, the first thing I found out is Rachel Hyam is, has a certification that I desperately covet and I'm going up for this, uh, this summer, which is the British Canoe Union three-star certification. It's a very difficult one. You have to be able to do a lot of interesting challenges. And Rachel said, oh, I'm certified, but I got certified when I was 18 or so, so there you go. Um, and one last thing about the Brits, there's actually a question on the exam, which is, why are British kayakers so much better than American kayakers? <laughs> I'm not actually kidding. My coach asked me that, and I said, well, are, are they? And he said, yes, they are. And, and since he's from Puerto Rico, I'm, I'll believe him. I'll tell you the answer afterwards. But anyways, you can see it's kind of a demanding skill, and there are a handful of people in the world that do this, um, most better than me. But I do a subset of that particular kind of kayaking, which is this. Um, in particular, I do urban kayaking. And that actually is me. Um, and I paddle around the waters of New York, as Robin mentioned, which means there are a whole different set of uh, perils and challenges that you face when you're uh, an urban paddler. Um, there are also some great adventures, such as the uh, opportunity to see a container ship getting loaded. A uh, couple things I want to highlight about the container ship, just for those who have not ever been close to a container ship when it was getting loaded. First off, 
they load them and unload them at the same time, which I think, you know, we were talking about operations and logistics. I think that's one of the coolest things in the world because it's so efficient and you're watching them do this. They also drop each of those containers right onto the bed of a truck and the truck zooms off so it's about as efficient as you can make it, uh, which is also really interesting. And then the other thing is when you get close to it, it is noisy as all get out. The racket is huge, the banging of metal, and, and you're literally sitting there going, boy, is one of those things going to come down on me? Um, the good news in this particular case is that, the, as you can see, the ship is anchored. That's not always the case in New York, and in fact, one of the reasons I wanted to kind of highlight this is uh, when we're paddling, we're paddling out there with a lot of company. Um, so we're paddling with container vessels, which then launch from the port. We're paddling out there with uh, oil tankers, barges, an awful lot of tugs, tugboats going this way and that way. They'll come into the story a little bit later. Um, we kayak with... Um, Ferries, a lot of ferries, East River Ferry big time, there's the Statue of Liberty Ferry, and then my personal nemesis, the Staten Island Ferry, which is really good at being where I want to be or sneaking up on me, despite the fact the thing is an enormous orange ferry. Um, and, you know, I've had some interesting, interesting run-ins with the Staten Island Ferry. And then on top of that, we have all the usual pleasure boating that you've got. Oh, we've, oh that's right, we've also got the, um, the folks who manage the waters, which the nice thing about New York is nobody's quite sure who has jurisdiction. So we have the Coast Guard, we have the New Jersey Police, we have the New York Police, we have the Parks Department. Each of them will give you conflicting instructions, which is great because you can always tell them the other guys told you to do what you're about to do. Uh, and it works out very well. Um, and then, of course, we have our pleasure boaters, including, you know, folks out in yachts, folks in sailboats. And like Taylor was out today in the jet ski. Uh, so they're all out there and you have to learn how to be part of this larger world. So one of the things you, you do, as Robin mentioned, is carry a lot of security gear. Uh, I carry a radio a lot, and I'll talk about how, you know, how that plays into things. You use that radio to communicate bidirectionally. I also carry a knife, which is useful for cutting fishing lines, but uh, not so good when you get on dry land, and the rules in New York are no, you know, no knives over this big, and my knife is bigger than that. Um, so you try to kind of keep it hidden. Um, but all sorts of interesting things that you carry, you know, a little bit more than if you're a day kayaker. Um, last but not least, so now you, you've understood that I'm a sea kayaker, I'm an urban sea kayaker, and I'm also an adventure kayaker or an expedition kayaker, which is a kind of a subset of all of the above. Because I have plenty of friends who are urban sea kayakers who think it's a great idea to go out and see the Statue of Liberty and go out for an hour or two, come back in, and to them that's an adventure. Um, I have kind of a fatal problem, which is that I always want to see what's around the next bend. I'm really curious. And so if I go out, I just want to keep going and see what's at the other end of things. And this leads me to do a lot of interesting things, like relatively recently, uh, in late July, actually late June, early July, uh, Vlad and I circumnavigated Long Island, as you can see here. Um, so a couple of points about this, because we're starting to get into the sort of main point of this presentation. First of all, Long Island, the circumnav was about 230 nautical miles, which is 265 land miles, as you can see. It took us 10 days. Everyone always asks how long did it take. It took us 10 days, 9 nights, because the last night we actually paddled all night because we were in a hurry to get home. Um, and seven of those nights were what we call commando camping, uh, which is camping where you're not supposed to be camping but aren't technically prohibited from camping. Um, so the trick to ca commando camping, as we discovered, is you basically try to stay off private property because that's not very nice and you don't want to annoy the homeowners. So you find public property that nobody quite cares about, you know, such as a beach at the tail end of a park where you're not technically supposed to camp, or maybe under a bridge, things like that. So uh, that's what we ended up doing. Expedition kayaking, though, has an awful lot to do with some of these kind of leadership sorts of issues because there are a lot of skills in addition to actual kayaking, and you can kind of imagine what they are. Uh, you have to do logistics and planning. You have to figure out your food. You have to figure out where you're going to camp. You have to worry about the conditions, not just when you start, but what they're going to be like at the other end. What's the wind? What's the tide? What's the currents? Is there going to be a nor'easter? Where is, is there a hurricane blowing in? All of these good things. Um, but I would say that probably the hardest thing about uh, expedition kayaking is that you actually have to work together. Um, and I wouldn't say, you know, fortunately, my paddling partner and I are, are very good at working together, but that's one of the things that, that really ruins most expeditions, or many expeditions, is that the people can't just, you know, after 10 days or 15 days or however long, they just can't continue to work together. Uh, and as you'll see, working together is actually one of those critical things that you sort of have to learn. Um, so that's... Uh, quite a bit about kayaking. Now there was that other aspect of leadership. So let me switch gears a little bit and uh, talk about different leadership paradigms. So that is my father. 
Uh, my father was a 30-year naval officer. He was in the Navy for 30 years. 15 of those years, he was on uh, nuclear submarines. And in fact, the culmination of that 15 years, he was the captain of the Woodrow, USS Woodrow Wilson, which was a ballistic sub. Um, this is important and it's relevant because this is where I learned, you know, I sort of learned leadership at my father's knee, so to speak. And I learned a particular model of leadership, which is probably very familiar to most of you because it's, the, it's been the dominant paradigm for the United States, for Britain, for most of the big things that we try to do, whether it's, you know, the military, whether it's business, whether it's sports, it's the command and control top-down model. Um, and we use that a lot, so let me just refresh everyone's memory as to what, how command and control works. There's a chain of command. Everybody knows where they are in the chain, and the chain restricts the lines of communication, so you're really not communicating a lot horizontally. Your communications horizontally are sort of very limited or defined. You communicate up and down, and decisions are made either by you or your boss, or someone above them, and you don't worry about that. So it's a very quick kind of, if it's, if it's at your pay grade, you make that decision. If it's above your pay grade, they make that decision, and you don't have to worry about it. So it does a fantastic job narrowing down the scope of what you have to do and what you have to be thinking about and how much processing you need to do. Um, the command and control model is, uh, has a lot of great strengths, and I don't, please don't listen to this and walk away thinking, oh, John is saying command and control is obsolete. You know, even John Chambers has said, you know, as much as he prefers command and control, he's moved to a different model, but the model that he's kind of evolving to is a little bit of a blended model, and I think that's really kind of the message that there is more than command and control, but it's not the command and control is obsolete. So let's talk a little bit about the strengths of command and control. Um, one of the big strengths of command and control is that it scales. It scales both in terms of time and it scales in terms of space because it, you know, it, it minimizes ambiguity so you know who's going to be making the decisions. Um, so you, it's either you or your boss or someone you don't care about because that decision is just happening out there. Uh, and it you know, doesn't require as much information flow because it's just going up and down. So some great examples of highly scalable command and control structures um, things like the Roman Catholic Church, which has scaled for, you know, 2,000 years and counting. Um, things like most militaries, the U.S. military, um, the British military, has, have scaled for hundreds of years, continue to operate, and by the way, they operate, all of these examples operate globally. So they're absolutely fantastic for scale. Um, the reason we still don't buy into the whole, you know, we don't continue to do nothing but command and control is you sacrifice things. Uh, one of the big things you sacrifice actually is the ability to leverage all of the talent in an organization because you limit it. Um, and in particular, what tends to happen is it's hard to push information up the chain. You know, you can push it as far as you, as far as you can, but then everyone is a gating point and a checkpoint on the way up. And if somebody higher than you decides the information doesn't need to go up, you're toast. It's not going anywhere. You can go around the chain of command, but it is highly frowned on and it tends to get you in, uh, in a lot of trouble. And in fact, I think the, you know, my dad being that, he's, he's also German, so for those of you from a German background who, or, you know, know someone who's German, he's got very much of that authoritarian, or had very much of that top-down model to things. And uh, his crew on the Woodrow Wilson actually created a uh, plaque that just really encapsulates the entire command and control model. Uh, I don't have a photo of it, so I'll describe it to you. It's a brass plaque that they handmade, they hand-tooled while on the ship. Uh, it's a, it's a cutout of a, a submarine with a line of little ducks inside it. All the ducks are in a row. And it's in order, as ordered, to the skipper from his crew from the Woodrow Wilson. And that's the essence of command and control. In order, as ordered. So that is the, you know, that's the dominant paradigm of most of the 20th century and most of the, uh, you know, most of the centuries before that. What is happening and what's changing and what's new? Well, this is the newer model of leadership. <laughs> Uh, and uh, for most of you, that is herd, a reference to herding cats. But let's take a small second. For, for those of you who have cats, let's think about the characteristics that have, the cats have that make them so diff difficult to herd. Um, first of all, they are highly independent, and they never listen to you, and they never do what you tell them to do. Um, they also love to talk back loudly, often. Uh, they also can fail to hear you, no matter how loudly you're talking, uh, and they all have opinions. Um, and they sometimes express those opinions in various ways and, you know, very, uh, very actively. 
Um, so when people say herding cats, that's really what they're talking about. But it also, you know, it's also true of a group of kayakers because kayakers, by definition, tend to go into the sport because they tend to be somewhat loner, somewhat feisty, not really willing to take direction and a command and control structure. So if you think about something like football, there's somebody in charge. I don't know a lot about football, but I know there are people in charge, and there are places that you play and if you're the quarterback you don't go out there and be the halfback because somebody else is that and you don't get to just make up your mind that you'd rather do that this day um, you know kayaking is kind of you you have complete freedom there are no rules really um, there are specifications but no rules it's also characteristic of a couple of things that we've been talking about and some that underlie what we've been talking about we talk about this IT to ET shift IT transformation Embedded in this is a notion of matrix, you know, matrix collaboration, communicating with people who have different agendas, you know, different priorities, and it's not really a command and control top-down world anymore if you're trying to embed IT into the business or align IT with the business. It's also true, we talked a little bit, I know the Cisco presentation had some great stats on the millennial generation. The millennial generation really views itself as free agents. Um, you know, they are they're young, they're used to being in charge of themselves, they're used to kind of saying, this is how I work, this is, you know, conform to me. And by the way, if I don't like you and your stodgy old company, I'm going to go somewhere else. And oh, by the way, with the uh, economy being what it is, there's a strong possibility that they may have to and be out on their own, so they tend to have a much feistier and more independent mentality. So really, this is an important leadership model to understand, and it also applies to one other thing, which is startups. I don't think we get to call Nemertes a startup anymore now that we turn 10 on October 3rd. Um, but we certainly are very entrepreneurial. Uh, and Robin's favorite saying is, you know, it takes 10 years to become an overnight success. Um, but that's, you know, that's the kind of thing that we're, you know, we consider ourselves pretty successful because we have all of you here. Um, but we still have that entrepreneurial free agent kind of a model. So really, this is where it all comes together. Because with kayaking, if you're leading a group of kayakers, it's a bit like managing your IT to ET transition, and quite a lot like managing your, your startup and your, your group of free agents. So let's talk about uh, some, of the, some of the connections a little more explicitly. And what I'll do is, is tell you some stories about what I've done kayaking and how they sort of correspond in the real world. But first off, that photo is actually supposed to be funny. Um, for those folks, and I didn't expect anyone to actually laugh, but if you notice, the two of them are, are not collaborating. They should have their paddles in the water at the same time. Uh, and, you know, we really wanted to get a photo of two people paddling and facing each other, but we couldn't do that. No, um, <laughs> uh, that's actually true. <laughs> that's uh, those friends of ours who are Guy and his wife, and that's exactly what they're doing. Um, so anyway, that's kind of a, an in-joke there. But uh, one of the big things that I learned early on in leading little groups of people across the Hudson and other places was that everybody matters. Um, and what I mean by that is traditional top-down, the boss is in charge, he says what to do or she says what to do, you go follow them and you listen and it's their job to make sure everything turns out okay. If you're leading a group of three or four kayakers across the Hudson, um, you may be sort of largely in charge because you're picking the direction, but you want every single person keeping their eyes and ears out for those big boats. Because you remember, we're out there with an awful lot of traffic and you want to tap everyone's resources to notice, hey, is there a boat coming? Is there a big ship coming? Is there a ferry that nobody noticed? Even if you're the boss and you're in charge, you know, you can actually have your skin saved by a very junior person out there going, um, that yeah, big ferry, maybe we don't want to go. Uh, so that's a very important thing you have to learn to listen to everybody and learn to encourage people to speak up. So an ex a simple example of how we do that in Emerdes is um, we really encourage everyone to weigh in with their ideas and opinions. Sometimes it gets a bit raucous. Um, but for example, we hired Megan not very long ago. She joined us actually in April. She came into the client services department. Those of you who are clients have probably already dealt with her and know she's wonderful. Um, but it was probably, I don't know, Megan, uh, three, three weeks after you started where you said, you know, guys, I have a suggestion to make. Our logo on the site, it's low res. It looks awful. I think we should change it. Well, in the command and control model, you're not allowed to say that because that's marketing. And you're not marketing. You're client services. Fortunately, we're not command and control model, so our reaction was exactly the opposite. We were like, Megan, great observation. Let's get the high-res logo out there. Let's do it. And I think it took us about an hour, and we had that updated. And, you know, we'd been going for nine years with low-res, and Megan called it, and now it looks a whole lot better. That's the kind of thing, you know, you, you need to be able to do. I think we've talked about it, and many of us pride ourselves on our ability to do it. But it really brings it home when you realize it is part of the new sort of paradigm. Um, the next one is share the vision. Um, 
And the reason I stress this, it's not just about, oh, touchy-feely, we all want to we all want to have the same vision. It's an important way to make sure everybody gets to the same place. Because if you can't tell them what to do, you have to inspire them with what to do by making sure everybody's in alignment on what the vision is. And one of the things I thought was really interesting in the IT transformation panel, and it was also true in Bernie's uh, keynote, was this notion that the IT transformation starts with sharing the vision. I mean, Rachel, that was the first thing you said. I remember Bernie said the hardest part, the first question Mark asked him, what was the hardest part? Bernie stood up and said, uh, it was clearly, it was you know, getting the executives on board with the vision. Um, and what that meant was not just, um, hey, we, guys, we think we want to do something. It's kind of interesting. It's like, this is how it's going to change your life. Experience that. See if this is something you want to buy into. If you buy into the notion that this is going to change your life for the better, then we can start working towards it. Um, and so an example in kayaking, actually, is when Vlad and I took off on our Long Island circumnav, uh, one of the questions Vlad asked me was, well, what, what kind of a trip is this? I kind of looked at him and went, uh, you know, the circumnav, circumnavigating Long Island, that kind of a trip? And he said, no, I, I want to understand what your vision for the trip is. Are we going to get out there and race and try to be the fastest people ever to circumnavigate Long Island and only sleep when we have to and only eat when we have to and just keep going until we can't keep going anymore? Or do we want to go and be a little leisurely camp and maybe picnic for lunch? And I was like, that one, that second one. That's, that's sounding a whole lot better to me. Um, but it's really kind of important when you're putting together a trip and it's something you have to ask people. Like, what's your idea of, the, you know, what is a good time here? What's your goal? Not just where are you going, but how do you expect to get there? And it really has powerful resonance for us in business because you really have to think, okay, what is it we're trying to do and how do we expect to get there and what do we think the experience is going to be like? I mean, I liked Bernie's phrase of some glass is going to break. Warning people, okay, there's going to be some rocky water, or, you know, rough water and maybe some rocks, but we'll get through it if we all agree this is where we want to go and we're not going to stop when the glass breaks. So I think that's a very important thing because it ensures everybody's in align alignment and they have the same goal. Um, this one, uh, m those of you who know me know that I really am a fanatic about communication. Uh, in fact, our clients have, uh, you know, Dave was asking us a couple of years ago, every time we send emails, every now and then he would send me an email and I'd respond with ACK. And he was saying, you know, well, what is this, some cat reference, hairballs? I mean, what's going on here? It's just, you know, it's just an acknowledgement just to make sure, yes, we've got you, we're on it, um, to confirm that the communication went through. Uh, but I've got to say, most of the time, communication is going to be somewhat imperfect in this model because you're not controlling information as tightly. It's coming from all sources. Everybody's trying to filter out everything. That's one of the weaknesses with the model. Of course, it's also one of the strengths. In the kayaking universe, the best anecdote I can give you to what you know, give you about what uh, communication and imperfect communication can mean is uh, I was doing a circumnavigation with three other people. It was one person's first time, and we were going counterclockwise around Manhattan. Uh, so we had made it all the way over to the to the Hudson side, and we were actually really pretty happy because we were like cruising down the Hudson. We were going at about six knots because we had about a two and a half to maybe three knot current. It was, a, it was a pretty powerful ebb that day. We were really happy. Coming down the side of the Hudson where we get to the, just about the area where the Intrepid is, uh, and right there, there are also cruise ships, so the big cruise ships that go to Bermuda and the Bahamas. It was a Sunday afternoon, and they typically go out at about 4 o'clock on the Sunday afternoon, and this was about 2.30. So we had our radios on. We were listening. Usually the cruise captains will actually tell us when they're, when they're about to pull out. Um, nothing on the radio, nothing going on, and one of the guys, actually the guy whose first time this was, said, um, Jonna? I think there's smoke coming out of the, the cruise ship, um, just saying. Uh, and I looked at him and I was like, oh my gosh, he's right. It's getting ready to pull out. Didn't warn us, didn't sound, nothing, nothing on the radio. Cruise ship's pulling out. Now we're barreling down into this at six knots. First thing you do is stop paddling. You suddenly realize, oh, I'm continuing to move at about three knots and I'm getting closer and closer to this. It's got pretty powerful engines. It's going to suck you under and not even know that it chewed you up and spit you out. So a couple of us just kind of said, okay, we've got to get out of here. You can paddle backwards, it's possible, and we probably could have, but it was pretty, still pretty intense. So we kind of, a couple of us yelled, hey, let's get over to the left, let's go over to the embayment and wait it out. We start paddling. One guy didn't hear us, and he's keeping going towards the cruise ship because he's la la la, not thinking about it. The, the guy who was the new, newbie on this was caught between us trying to decide, do I go to safety with everyone else or try to rescue this guy, what do I do? So finally, we just started yelling a lot, and everybody kind of came over, and you know the, the disaster was averted. 
Um, and then we spent quite a lot of time in the bar afterwards doing a post-mortem on this and kind of trying to impress two things on the two, two people. One was, if you're caught between trying to decide to go to safe, whether to go to safety and rescue somebody, go to safety. Um, you can't rescue them if you're dead. Uh, so it really, it's a really bad idea. And for the other guy, it was like, dude, you've got to pay attention. When everybody's screaming and yelling, you want to listen. Um, however, you're going to have imperfect communication. You have to have that built into your plans. Uh, and finally, talking to outsiders is incredibly important. Um, many of you here at this conference have already had the experience of us, one or more of us, walking up to you and saying, what do you think we should do about this? Oh, we, we have a decision to make. Can we, you know, Stephen, you and I were talking about something that we were thinking, oh, that's a great idea. We want to hear your input on a, you know, on a couple of things. We're not just doing this to make you feel good. Um, this is really how we get some of our best information and some of our best insight. I know you guys are interested in talking to outsiders because you're here talking to each other. Um, but I can't stress enough that that's incredibly important in this particular model. It's not part of the top-down command and control model. In fact, you'll notice that top-down organizations tend to be very insular. That's a, that's a flaw with them. They, they do a lot of navel-gazing. They listen only to each other, and then they're in a giant echo chamber, and it's harder to get them to listen to the outside world. You know, with this kind of model, you want to do a lot of reality testing and sanity checking on the outside world. And of course, since this is a kayaking presentation, I have to have a kayaking an anecdote about that. Uh, one time, Vlad and I were ca crossing um, the uh, Kiel Van Kull, which is a giant, uh, pretty serious chi shipping channel between Staten Island and Bayonne, New Jersey. So you get a lot of oil tankers, you get container ships and things like that going back and forth and tugs. And I mean, it, you, you know, it's really no place to go play in a kayak if you don't know what you're doing. So we were getting ready to pass, and we were listening to the radio to see you know, what the traffic was. And one of the tug captains got on and said to another one, hey, just want to warn you, watch out. There's a couple of kayakers out there. Geniuses. So I picked up the radio, and I said, uh, Captain, these are the kayakers. We're waiting till you pass. We're not going to move till you're gone. Thank you. And he said, you know, thank you. <laughs> um, but it's a two-way communication. That's why I carry a radio that I can communicate on. So talk to outsiders, listen to outsiders, and communicate with them. Uh, finally, we're kind of coming into the home stretch where I talk about risk and what does all this have to do about risk and, and what I've learned about risk. Um, the first thing is, uh, and this is probably one of the biggest takeaways, get comfortable being uncomfortable. Um, I have pretty much hit the point where if a, every single day I have to go out of my comfort zone somewhere, typically doing something that I'm afraid of. If I don't, I'm getting too comfortable. Um, that's really not as much fun as it sounds, <laughs> um, but it's really important because you finally get it in your head that just because something is pushing you out of your comfort zone, pushing you out of what you think you can do, pushing you into something that makes you scared, doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. Um, so that's probably one of the, one of the first things that I'd, I'd want to highlight. Uh, and I think about something that Mark was saying at the, uh, at the um, IT transformation panel where, you know, I think it's something like 50 universities um, in the you know, SUNY system, and only a handful of them are really embracing change. And he said it was really interesting because there was a group of folks, you know, they could be young, they could be old, they could be anywhere in between who just were hoping to kind of, you know, see no evil, hear no evil, say no evil, and wait till all this change kind of, you know, passed them by so they didn't have to deal with it. And his point was, it's not going to work that way. You know, you have to change, you have to get used to embracing change. It's hard, it's unpleasant, but it's a really good idea. You're going to need to reinvent yourself in this IT to ET world, and you might as well get comfortable with the uncomfortableness of making a change. And, you know, I was listening to that, and I was thinking, yep, getting, getting comfortable, being uncomfortable is a skill that we all really need right now. Um, very important to have. Next one is... Uh, Take risks, but don't take stupid risks. Uh, I'll give you an example from my experience, that, uh, but please don't, don't tell anyone outside this room because it is an example of a stupid risk. Um, uh, there was one saving grace that made it only slightly less stupid. Early on when I was learning to paddle, um, they, they teach us a lot about rescues, and I'm not going to bore you with all the details of the rescues, uh, but one of the rescues that they teach you is when you can't roll, you aren't ready to roll yet, uh, if you go upside down in the water, you do what's called an Eskimo rescue. Um, an Eskimo rescue is not an Eskimo roll. You're literally hanging out underwater. What they teach you to do is reach up. You're actually reaching this way, but I'm going to do it this way. You reach up around the boat and you go thump, 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 thump to attract attention. Mind you, you're hanging out underwater. Then you wave your hands back and forth so that another boat can come by, stick its bow into one of your hands so you can grab it and flip yourself up. So, you know, thump, wave. That's what they teach you. Uh, and the first time I heard this, I said, that's completely insane. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard, particularly in cold weather. 
Because if you think about this, you go flip, you're underwater, you're now running out of air, you're getting closer to hypothermia, and the chances that one of your colleagues is going to notice you is slim to none. You've got like 90 seconds, maybe two minutes, depending on how long you can hold, hold your breath. This is a stupid rescue. Why are you teaching us this? Um, there's a reason that my coaches get frustrated with me, because I think I saw <laughs> um, and they explained very politely that the BCU said it was very important rescue and we needed to learn it and we weren't going to pass and we might as well learn it. Um, so I said fine, but I still didn't believe it was very useful. So uh, a little bit later on, it was February, the water was about 42 degrees and I was out paddling with a friend and a coach. Check out this rescue. I'm going to capsize, let my friend come and rescue me or not rescue me, let's see what happens and don't do anything. Coach was kind of startled, obviously that's not normally what people are supposed to do, but he didn't have time to react. We paddled out, I capsized. There I am hanging out underwater, thump, thump, thump. Wave, 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 nothing. Thump, 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 thump. Wave, wave, wave. I'm like, all right, I'm kind of running out of air. I proved my point, no rescue. I win, I win, uh, and I go to pop out, and I can't get out. And the spray skirt stuck to the kayak, which is what everybody's terrified of when they go kayaking. I'm underwater, and I'm not coming out of the boat. And it's cold, and I'm running out of air. And I literally had about that much time to process, and I, I remember thinking, oh boy, this, does not, this one does not end well. Uh, and all of a sudden, I was up in the air and getting flipped over. What had happened? Well, the coach was paying attention. He's like, she's down there an awful long time, came over, flipped me up, and, you know, there was, you know, a lot of, little bit of fluster and, and bother, and my friend was going, <laughs> What the hell's going on here? Um, so uh, that was a stupid risk. The one thing that actually made it a less than terminally stupid risk was that I mentioned it to the coach. Um, I will say, though, that it was a very useful risk because it, uh, you know, it ended up teaching us all something. Uh, first of all, my other coaches, when they found out, lit into me and ripped me a new one. I mean, they were just brutal. They said, you never do that. You never play games like that. You know, you were taking your life in your hands. True. Uh, what we did do, though, was realize that if you are going to expect that kind of rescue, you should discuss what kind of rescues you're, you're going to expect and be prepared to give before you launch out on the trip. And, oh, by the way, the other big thing I learned was how to pop my spray skirt pop properly under all conditions. <laughs> uh, I really am quite good at that now, and I am not at all worried about that ever happening again. Um, so all in all, it was really, really educational. Uh, but please, if you're taking risks, make them, make them safe ones, or safer ones. Um, Gear is good, but skill is irreplaceable. Uh, since you know, we're all about technology, which is all about gear, uh, I kind of hesitate to say you know, there's something better than gear. But I was thinking about this a lot during the sessions this week, because we talk about, you know, one of the things we talked about was the challenge of outsourcing and, you know, Irwin's wonderful vision, that, you know, image that everybody had, you know, some people are going this way, outsourcing, and the other people are insourcing this way, and they kind of pass in the middle and wave in the trapeze. Um, one of the reasons that outsourcing fails is that you outsource too much of the irreplaceable knowledge. It can be institutional knowledge, it can be deep technical knowledge, it can be some mix, it can be business process knowledge. Uh, and the truth is, if you have that knowledge, even if the gear fails, you know, the organization can still do pretty well. Uh, and just as an example of that from the kayaking, when we went on our Long Island Circumnav, we thought we were doing pretty well because we had backups for everything. I mean, we had three cameras, you know, four headlamps, you know, well, two headlamps actually, uh, two um, GPSs and a couple of other, you know, duplicate electronic equipment. Everything failed. Not all of it. I think we ended up with one working headlamp or maybe two working headlamps out of three. Um, we ended up with, two, with one working camera out of three and we ended up with two failed GPSs. So it was a darn good thing that in the one part of the Long Island Circumnav, which wouldn't you know, was in between uh, Montauk and Orient Point, when you actually do have to have some navigational ability, because it's not just keep the land on your left, uh, we actually were able to work with compasses and charts and figure out where we were going and you know, get in for dinner, um, dinner being very important. Um, but the key thing is you really don't want to go out there and say, oh, wow, I, I don't need to know what I'm doing. I don't need to read a chart because I've got a GPS. Same thing in our universe. You know, having the people with that institutional and business process and technical skill is really critical. Uh, and last but not least, and I think this is kind of the big one, uh, don't be ruled by your fears. Um, and I know this is really basic, and many of you are sitting here thinking, yeah, you know, we know, that's what motivational speakers always say. But I think it's got special reson resonance for us in the tech world, because as I've said a couple of times, we've been living through a depression that really lasted since 2000, since the tech crash where once, you know, once that happened, essentially the attitude towards technology was we're not going to invest in it, we've got it under control, 
you know, and for technologists, it was don't rock the boat. Don't make changes. And changes, if you made them, ended up badly. You know, if, you, if they ended up badly, you ended up out on the street. You couldn't put your kids through college, you know. And I know people this happened to, so, and all of you do too, probably. So you kind of learn to internalize this idea, I'm going to keep my head down, do what the boss wants, and I'm not going out there. Um, it's really time to put our heads up and, and think, you know what, it is time to start taking risks. It is start, time to start doing new prototypes, test driving things that may not work. Of course, you want to le level set the universe around them, make the, don't make this risk stupid, you know, but you do really want to bring your head out and start taking those risks, cause rem remembering that, you know, what could go right trumps what could go wrong. So, kind of, in, uh, and actually that's one last point I wanted to talk about calculated risks and going out of my comfort, comfort zone. Uh, as a kayaker, um, one of the big things I learned sea kayaking was, you know, rocks are bad. Rocks will hurt you. Waves hit rocks. The combination of waves and rocks will damage kayaks, will damage kayakers. Therefore, my algorithm was see a rock, stay very far away. Um, but I went on a class uh, earlier this summer, a two and a half day class, to learn what uh, they like to call rock gardening which means getting as close to possi as possible to rocks, preferably in really big waves, and having fun with it. Um, again, this was one of those things I thought was a little insane, but I figured I matured a little bit by that point, so I you know, decided I would actually learn what all the fun was. Uh, I discovered that if you understand wave dynamics, you can get close to ro big rocks very safely. It's incredibly exciting. It's like doing whitewater kayaking except in the ocean. Um, it requires skill, but you know, doesn't really punish you for not having skill. And it's just it's a boatload of fun, no pun intended. Um, it is a blast. And so that's me in the white helmet just being all excited about going into, you know, those, those waves are breaking over big rocks and it was, it was really, really quite a lot of fun. Um, which kind of brings me to the summary of what we've learned. Some of the key takeaways here. You know, leading a 21st century ET team is a lot more like kayaking than football or a lot more like kayaking than the military. Um, there's no structure. You know, people don't have defined playlists. Uh, there are no rules or very few rules, uh, and there's no real formal authority. So you've got to figure out how to work together, how to organize each other, and how do you do that? Well, you focus on sharing the vision, creating and sharing the vision, and making sure you understand what it means to everyone on the team, not just your vision of what it means to you, but what it means to them. Uh, listening to your team. Robin pointed out that I seem to listen a lot more because it dawned on me that other people had something that I really needed to hear, uh, to say, and when they said that, it was, it was very useful. Um, learning from your mistakes. I think, you know, I, I love the whole quote that Thomas Edison is, you know, credited with when he was trying to figure out what a great filament for a light bulb would be. Uh, and he was trying everything. I mean, he tried everything under the sun and supposedly, it may be apocryphal, but supposedly he tried 10,000 different things and they all failed. And somebody said, you know, gee, how does it feel to have failed 10,000 times? And he said, I haven't failed 10,000 times. I've found 10,000 things that don't work. That means the next one might be the one that does, and it was. It was the wire filament. Um, and that's really it. If you stop and you look back and you say, what did this mistake teach me? You haven't failed. You're just learning from your mistake. It's not a failure. It's not even really a mistake. It's just something that has something to teach you. And that's a really good model to keep in your head, especially as you're building out prototypes. You want to say, oh, I think I can solve this problem better with this technology, and whoops, you didn't think of something. That's OK. That just means you learned a little bit more about the problem you were trying to solve. Uh, and I will have to say the biggest thing I learned is take risks. The best things in life and in business lie on the, on the other side of your fears. Um, and you know, that's as true in business as it is in life. So in closing, I'm going to quote someone nameless, which is the big takeaway here really is that nameless graffiti artist who put uh, no guts, no glory out there. So with that, thanks very much. Thank you.